Well, welcome uh, everybody to this week's uh, session of the EV Club. Um, the EV Club has been uh, created about two years ago by, by Ken Whitwer, and it's now an uh, event uh, run uh, through the ISEF, uh, and uh, it's a great weekly uh, event that uh, you are many to join very, very regularly. And this week, we are going to have one of the regular occasions where the EV Club is run uh, in collaboration with the Student Network for Extracellular Vesicles, SNEV. And um, so this session will be uh, co-moderated by uh, Johnny White, uh, who's here, and I'm, I'm going to let now her introduce our speakers and today's uh, paper. Thank you so much. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Joni, um, and I'm co-moderating moderating today from New Zealand. Um, so I'm part of the student network for um, EVs, and so we're a student-led um, organisation for students. Oh, sorry, a more of a network. Um, and we are, um, yeah, so we've been running for a couple of years now. And if you're interested in joining and you're a student, um, feel free to just um, either send me a message or go onto our um, Twitter. So yeah, thank you um, for, our, um, for being part of this and for coming today, because this is going to be a really interesting talk from um, Cohen and David. Hello, everyone. My name is Kuna. I want to thank everybody uh, here in the session to take some time away from the bench and not doing any exciting experiments for the moment. So, and I also want to thank the moderators and the organizers from ISEV and ISNEF. So today I'm going to talk about uh, actually a problem that everybody that's working with EVs encounters many times during their experiments. So to just illustrate this problem, I'm going to show here an, isolate, an isolation of EVs. So we, here we start with a pretty clean solution. In this case, it is um, cell media. So what you do is first you want to get rid of your cells. After that, you want to upconcentrate your EVs because mo most of the time you try to accumulate over time in a very big diluted sample uh, or media your EVs. And the way you do that sometimes is by, for example, upconcentrating with a cutoff filter. So what you do is actually a first purification step where small molecules go through the cutoff filter and um, the remaining ones are, for example, bigger size EVs or in our, ca or in our case EVs. So, uh, <clears throat> so then you have to do additional purification steps, which is, for example, size exclusion chromatography. And what you do in this case, you bring on this filtrate on the size exclusion column, and then you can separate or convolute everything that's in your media based on size. So in our case, EVs are bigger size compared to uh, proteins, which are smaller size. And then um, if you do such an experiment and you look at from a protein perspective, then you can see something like this. So what you see is very obvious. You have two kind of peaks where there's one striking big peak and a very small uh, other peak here. Well, this big peak is actually part of your contaminants because these are your free proteins. And so you're working against, um, uh, with, with your very small EVs, you're working against a large contam contamination here. The other thing that's striking is that you actually have an overlap kind of here. So you see that there's a risk that your free proteins leak into your EVs. So again, that can contaminate your sample. But the other side, you also have the chance that your EVs, that you risk not having smaller EVs because there's in your protein fractions, for example. So to just demonstrate this schematically, this is, let's imagine, this is your starting solution. So in green, you see EVs of interest. And as you can see in yellow, these are your contaminants. There's much more yellow because there's much more contaminants in your, uh, in your solutions than your EVs of interest. And these contaminants doesn't need to be necessarily proteins. They can, for example, be RNA, DNA, etc. It depends what you're looking for essentially in your EVs. So not only contaminants are these biomolecules, but they essentially can also be other EVs, for example, if they don't have the, the cargo that you wish to look for. So naturally, people are focusing on every time getting more and more contaminants away, and they do this over mul multiple steps, and they want to end up with a pure, uh, high-quality EV prep in the end. So I, I showed you in the beginning that we do for example, two steps. First, a cutoff. You get rid of very small EV, uh, very small 
contaminants. Then we do, for example, size exclusion step. Then you get even more contaminants away. And you, you see that you end up with a lot of steps that, that you have to go through. The problem is that we never know exactly when you, we get to this pure uh, step. So what we do, for example, is we um, uh, we every time need to check at each time whether we have a pure sample, whether you still have contaminants and such. So you lose again, uh, uh, you, you lose again product that can be of interest in the end. The other thing is when you when you reach further purification steps, it gets harsh, harsher and harsher to get rid of these. Uh, these contaminants. So you have to, for example, expose your sample to non-physiological conditions, which could be high G or osmotic pressure, for example, um, uh, sucrose gradients or uh, iodexanol. So these can all be compromised, not only your EV, but it could also potentially compromise your cargo that's in the EVs. So we wanted to go from another perspective. Like I said, every time you take away contaminants at a time, and so you focus on the on the you see your purification based on proteins. So your proteins are smaller or contaminants are smaller than your EVs. So you focus on these uh, kind of properties. We now wanted to shift the focus more to properties that we only have in EVs or we could only generate in the EVs. So and you select for these, and then the leftover would be your contaminants. So. In general, now we get to the aims of this paper that I want to talk about. So we want to generate a technique that could isolate EVs in a kind of minimal amount of isolation steps, making it fast and avoid contaminants. And at each point, we would like to see if EVs are present or not. So um, we imagine this could be a kind of controlled um, a capture where you can, for example, take your EVs of interest and then put them in, uh, in a solution of interest, preferably a physiological condition. The other thing that's uh, interesting is if you put it in a solution, you can control the volume of a solution. And this is a, something we uh, see a lot as a problem, like, for example, the size exclusion example that I gave you. You see that your EV prep is actually spread out over multiple fractions. So it is in a high volume, which actually, when you put these, for example, in, in mice or in cells, it can be too diluted to see an effect. So uh, what you want is you want a very concentrated EV sample to see and in fact, for example, for downstream exper experiments or applications. So without telling you what we exactly did, you can see how uh, we generated a viral construct. And if we transduce cells with it, it looks like this. So don't focus on these uh, blue dots because this is DAPI, so this is a dye. But uh, what you see here is very diffuse green signal. So this is... Um, is a kind of cell specific uh, signal. Well, you have these red dots, which are nanoscopic and very bright. And these obviously are where our EVs originate from. So our goal was to kind of generate a method, which we call a kind of tweezer method, where you pick out these uh, red dots from the media. You can examine them. If you want, you can even modify them while you, take, while you have them in your tweezer. And then you put them in another kind of solution. And so um, on a molecular level, you can see it as such. So we made a construct which makes one single mRNA, and then uh, it gets translated to a protein that breaks up into different proteins based on self-cleavage sites. The first protein that I'm going to talk about is pyromycin. So this is just, as you all know, an antibiotic where you can select for uh, the cells that actually express your construct of interest. The other thing is COP-GFP, which is a G very bright GFP, so you can identify your cells like you saw previously. It's very diffuse over the cytoplasm because it doesn't really have a kind of signaling peptide. The other thing, the red dots were punctuated because they are actually tagged to a kind of protein that shuttles it to EVs. So in our case, it was... Uh, a tetraspanin, as you know, uh, tetraspanins are accumulating in EVs, and in our case, we use CD63, and we put it on the C-terminus of CD63, which makes sure that it ends up in the cytoplasm of the cell. If this happens, it also ends up in the cytoplasm or in the lumen of your EVs. The other thing that we added was an analucifrase, which is in short nanolook, and uh, we actually embedded this in the sequence of uh, the CD63. This makes sure that we can get it at the uh, extracellular loop, actually mainly in the first extracellular loop, um, 
so it gets exposed on the surface of the cells. So uh, when it's on the surface on the cells, the same thing is with the EVs, it's on the surface of the EVs. That brings us actually with the name that we made, uh, that we named our construct. So it's called Nomi in short, which is stands for Nanolook on the outside and Cherry on the inside. So the other thing you might have noticed is this uh, purple thingy here. And this is actually how we enabled our uh, tweezer method. So this is a specific uh, affinity tag that's unique. Uh, for our EVs. So in our case, it's next to the nano phrase. So it's on the, again, on the exacellular surface. So as such, you can use this kind of tag to pick out your uh, EVs if you want to. Um, so we went back to our original experiment. We just let cells accumulate EVs and media. We then went from a big volume to a small volume, so we can uh, easily manipulate it. Nowadays, we know that you actually don't need to go so far. You don't need to have big volumes. You can use very diluted sample, and this method will still work. But anyhow, here we did it like this. So we up concentrate our sample. Then we added uh, these beads, and these beads have, um, or anti-flag beads, so they have antibodies that actually can uh, retrieve or flag tag in the solution. As I told you, this is on the EVs, so it will pick out the EVs uh, <clears throat> with these beads. And these beads are magnetic, so it makes it easy for us. We put a magnetic field on our solutions. The bead uh, binds to the magnet and drags along the EV with it. Then the, all the contaminants or all the other constituents in our, in our media or then easy uh, or then accessible so we can wash multiple times and um, we can get rid of them. The nicest thing here in comparison with other techniques is then you can recover your EVs from these beads. So what you can do is, for example, you can add an illusion peptide. This peptide has a higher affinity to these antibodies compared to the EVs. And as such, when you do this, these peptides cover the whole bead and then your EVs uh, or free in solution. So then you can retrieve it in very small volumes, which would counter the, uh, the thing I said earlier with very diluted sample. So we went back to our technique I, I told you in the beginning, so size exclusion chromatography. And nowadays, you, now you see a complete difference compared to the previous graph. So the previous graph, the blue one that I showed you, had very high uh, free protein peak while a very small EV peak. Well, in this case, it's much different. So you have one single peak that's very prominent present uh, compared to the uh, free protein one. And of course, you can argue, yeah, this is an, maybe this is an artifact. So um, the nicest thing of our technique, like I said, you you hold the EV, so then you can manipulate it too. So what we did when it's on the beads, uh, we we alize the EV with a detergent. So we hold it on the beads, we expose it to detergent. This makes sure that you lyse away all the lipid layer and all the elements that are actually responsible for the size and content of your EV. And then after you do this, you can again elute uh, your product from the beads, and then you get only the protein. So by comparing these two, you can easily see that there's a shift in profile. So when you have only the protein, you have this gray graph, and then you actually only have the pure protein. So with this simple trick, we can actually know um, that, that we have intact EVs. But you don't have to go so far, like to analyze your EVs. You can just, for example, use all the, con all the components that we have on our EVs to study them. And so one of these things, like I said, is M-Cherry. So for example, to know how many uh, EVs you have, you can, for example, tether them uh, to antibodies. So we have antibodies printed on a chip. Each antibody can capture one or two EVs, and then you can see which antibody actually has, uh, has M-Cherry signal. And so as expected, CD63 is most present, of course, has most M-Cherry because we put our tag in, an, in a CD63 molecule. Um, the other ones, uh, CD81 and CD9, were much less uh, had much less M cherry. You can now also see something about or say something about the cargo. So uh, what we see is the bigger the size. If you look to a single EV and you you look at the size, the bigger size EV has more um, 
has more capacity to hold multiple Voronis proteins. And that's actually what we see. Um, the bigger the size we have, the more fluorescence we have. So that's, uh, uh, so like, like such, you can, for example, look at your EVs. Um, as M cherry is a protein, you can also check if your EV is intact. So um, you can see this in Western blood, of course, but you can also check with uh, protein SK treatment. So if the EV is intact, then the M cherry is not accessible for the protein SK. So that's what you see here. There's no drop in signal because uh, the lipid layer prevents the protein SK to uh, degrade the M cherry and as such lower the fluorescence. So what we could do, for example, is again, we break down the lipid layer so it becomes accessible for protein SK. And that's what we did here. So you can see only if you break down the layer, then you can actually lower the fluorescence um, in the last bar graph here. So next to M-Cherry, we have also Nanolook. Nanolook is again a protein, but now it's on the surface. So if now you expose it to protein SK, then it will get degraded because it's accessible for protein SK. And so, um, and that you can see, for example, the signal drops enormously if you expose it to protein SK. The other thing that's very prominent here is the numbers. So here you have a million, while previously you had much no, lower numbers. And the reason for that is because M cherry is a single protein. So you're very dependable on the single protein that gives you amount of fluorescence. While with uh, luciferase or nano look here, it can one protein can turn over a lot of substrate, so it uh, it boosts the detection. You get uh, much more signal from one protein than uh, uh, than, for example, with fluorescence. However, when we test this, we um, there's a limit to this. So if you dilute your sample, for example, here we did the dilution ten times, we, the signal dropped to almost less than ten percent. And if you diluted a thousand times, we couldn't even detect it anymore. So we were trying to overcome this problem because we wanted to look to very rare events. And the way we could do this, for example, is to uh, use the full potential of an EV actually. So an EV is, as we all know, a multi-carrier of cargo. So in essence, next to protein, it can have other biomolecules. And in our case, we focused on the RNA that's present in the EVs. And so we focused on something that's not actively uh, packaged in EVs. In our case, the CUB-GFP, remember? In the cell, we had a very diffuse signal in the cytoplasm while the dots were, uh, were red, were very prominently packaged into EVs. Well, uh, the CUB-GFP isn't. So we focused on a molecule that's not as a protein so much present, but more, uh, have more uh, more promising things in our uh, detection uh, based on the RNA level. So that's what we did here. So we uh, isolated the RNA from our EVs, then we uh, used PCR and we did digital droplet PCR, so to even boost detection even more. And you could see even after a million times dilution, we could still pick it up. So with all our tools in place, we wanted to actually answer with our constructs or nomic construct uh, questions that are hard to answer with current technology. And one of these questions is actually uh, if EVs can leak from the brain to other bodily parts. And so what you wanted to generate is a very small distinct amount of cells that actually secrete EVs and then we look if they end up in, in the bloodstream. So the first attempt we did th to this was injecting a lentiviral vector in, uh, in a very distinct brain region. And so you can see when you do this, this, this uh, transduction only happens at the injection site itself. And so we can see this because again, we have all these stacks on, on our uh, construct. We have uh, green, which is cop GFP, <clears throat> and sorry, and the red, which is in cherry. So we had a very small amount of uh, cells that were transduced, and these were endogenous cells of the mouse. And then next to fluorescence, we could go to our other component, which was a nanolook. We could see in, in mice, for example, that uh, we could see the expression of nanolooks or uh, or our uh, construct was present or an expressed. And the other thing we could see is that um, even in the brain, we could easily detect it. So you can, for example, do sections and then you can measure the nano look and actually have a quantific quantification of the amount of cells or EVs that are present there. 
which is very hard to do, for example, with fluorescence because you have so much background of or autofluorescence in the brain. Uh, so it's much hard to do this with, for example, COP-GFP or uh, with M-cherry fluorescence. However, we then tested in the blood whether we could see nanolook, and actually we didn't. We couldn't see it. Like I said, this we expected this a kind of because we had so little cells that were transduced. And if you look at the blood volume, it's pretty high, and uh, we couldn't see it. Uh, um, we couldn't see it significantly. So, uh, so then we went over to our uh, PCR methods, uh, and this is the way we isolated the EVs from from the blood. We depleted our cells from the blood. Then we exposed our serum that we uh, that we uh, that we got from the blood with our uh, beads. We picked out the EVs of interest, and then we did PCR, and we could uh, see the signal. The signal could only be because uh, from from the cells that we had because uh, that were transduced, uh, because they were the only ones that have this COP GFP, which is normally not present in, in mice. The only other disadvantage you can have is that when you inject a virus that other cells can be transduced. For example, endothelial cells or blood vessels in the brain. Uh, and these are even blood cells themselves. And these can end up with also, again, secreting EVs in the blood, but there's not residential cells of the brain. So to circumvent that, we wanted to have like an other kind of way to look at the question. And this was, for example, to transduce um, human neuron, neuronal progenitor cells. So these are, uh, in short, NPCs. And these, when you implant them in the brain, they don't divide so much. So they stay, again, very restricted around the injection site. So here we transduced it outside of the mouse and then implanted them. So we don't have the risk that, uh, for example, blood vessels get hit. And so when we do this, you can, again, see all the markers that come up. Uh, it's COP GFP and Cherry, FLAGTAC, they were all present uh, whenever we uh, implanted our cells. And the other thing we could see is then, because these are human cells, these are um, derived from patients, uh, we could uh, see the human markers. So in this case, this was PAC6 and Nestin. And uh, these are, for example, tell us also that the cells are in healthy shape, so they um, express early uh, progenitor cells, uh, early progenitor stage markers are these. So then we checked again the blood and we could see that with our method again, nanolog didn't tell us so much, but the COP-GFP expression or the RNA that we harvested from the blood uh, could uh, tell us that we had uh, COP-GFP and it's expressed higher when you go further, uh, when, the, when the cells were implanted longer in the mouse. So in a nutshell, we had to overcome a lot of hurdles uh, to generate a method where you can easily take out EVs from very complex uh, media, whether it's from the brain or from, um, from the blood. And we had to put multiple labels on them. And then, uh, but any, anyhow, we, we could answer some questions we, could, we couldn't do without this kind of technique. So, I want to thank David, uh, Shadi, and Sandra, uh, that all and all the other co-authors uh, that collaborated with with us to get this data. And please feel free to ask any question you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kuhn. That was a great presentation. <laughs> So, okay, so really interesting work. And I actually just wanted to ask if you checked how expression of this construct, how it affects um, um, this um, compos um, composition of EVs, maybe more specifically uh, tetraspanins. Um, does normal um, like physiological tetraspanin profile change if you express um, your construct in the cells? For yeah, example? so of course we overexpress it, so we force the system. Um, but uh, the, the, the reason why I emphasize we actually manipulated the first loop is because the second loop is actually most of the time it has all the sugars on it, which are, were uh, most of the antibodies or are, are, um, are work are actually focusing on the second loop. So we could still use uh, CD63 antibodies to use on our EV. So actually, we cannot really distinguish with antibodies between our construct and endogenous one. 
Mm -hmm. um, but indeed, I mean, it would be very interesting if, for example, our overexpression pushes out, for example, other tetraspanins. Uh, yeah, we can look in this for sure in the future, but now we would we ju just we would just wanted to try if it's even feasible to do it. So, um, but indeed, it's a very interesting question. Do, if you have any uh, ideas for us, please tell us too. Well, <laughs> um, no, not at the moment, but yeah, great work. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mika. Um, similar to your question, um, James Drummond has asked um, if you know whether I, uh, I can ask James to unmute Sirius. Um, you can just ask a question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I just was wondering, these are, and uh, you already answered part of it, so your mutations are in the smaller loop of CD63. Um, and that certainly helps, at least with detection. But I just was wondering if you had any idea of, you know, does it affect trafficking, binding to other receptors, et cetera? Yeah, so we didn't. So the thing is, we were always at the detection limit. So uptake and other organs, we actually could not see it. Uh, we looked at it. So, um, but we didn't expose, for example, on other cells and see if receptor activation or something happened with that. But uh, indeed, we could look into that. But yeah. um, I have to say the first loop is quite flexible. You can put a lot of proteins in there, even bigger sized ones. So, um, uh, but maybe that would be more compromising for a receptor, a receptor interaction. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Well, thank you, James. Um, and the next question is from Sunia. Hi, um, very nice work. Um, I have a question about the detection of the g and cherry in the blood after the intracranial injection of the uh, construct expressing cells. Uh, you showed the data of the you know, extracellular RNA detection, but how about the actual construct, you know, g duk or m -cherry, could you detect it in the blood? We, we couldn't see it. We, uh, we tried it with... Um... Uh, we, you mean the nanoluciferase, the bioluminescence, you mean, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, nanoluc in theory, I mean, uh, should be more sensitive than GLUC, uh, but anyhow, we couldn't detect it in, in our case. We just did, uh, that's why we went over to uh, PCR methods, but we checked for it, if that's what you're wondering. Okay. Uh, 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 is it possible that you can use the extra view platform to detect it in, at the particle level? Have you tried that? Uh, the exoview, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we did. So you can even capture CD60 and detect with, you know, yeah. Tag, for example. Yeah, yeah. Actually, that would be a very neat method from the. We did it from the media, but we didn't do it for the mice. But indeed, that probably then we will be able to see it because it's probably something limit of the. Yeah, like for example, for the M cherry, you have the blood, which has a lot of background in the red uh, spectrum. So, but you don't have this uh, aspect with exoview. It's very, uh, very nice uh, suggestion. Thank you. Uh, the other question when you look at your paper in the biomaterials, uh, it, you, you listed three different mouse models uh, C50, BR6, and about CT3 in the noodle mouse. Uh, which animal is applicable for this uh, implantation study? So in our case, we used human cells, so we had to go over to newt mice. Uh, but um, we also do other experiments where we implant mouse cells and mouse brains, and then it's also feasible to see it. But we're, you have to wait for a follow-up paper to, <laughs> to read that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So um, next question is from Philip. Can you tell us of an instance that we could understand where this assay has been useful. Are you, uh, in, I mean, in our case, it was just to answer if EVs could leak from the brain. But if you're asking for a disease or something, obviously, this is not like this is an, not an endogenous protein. So you need to transduce it somehow. Um, so for us, it was you can, for example, look for cargo that EVs can carry. If, for example, we transduce brain cells. So you could, for example, uh, these expressing cells could, for example, you could see in the EVs what other cargo they, for example, carry along with it. That's, 
that's what we're focusing on again on on another follow-up paper that you're working on well for instance there's a a lot of controversy about how many microRNAs a single EV or a group of EVs could have? Is this assay useful in looking at that controversial question? So in our case, we just uh, checked for COP-GFP uh, RNA, so we could look to other RNAs. If you, for example, embedded it in the in the viral construct, I guess that's feasible. Yes, but we didn't we didn't do it. I was thinking more of endogenous microRNAs. Well, the thing is, of course, you overexpress something, so you have to make sure that you don't outcompete the natural uh, capture, for example, of your RNAs. So you have to take this as a bias in your model, but obviously, if it's uh, produced by the cells and it is very prevalent ca uh, packaged into AVs, potentially you should be able to pick it up with this model, I guess. Uh, question is from Paula. Hey, hi everybody, I'm from Italy, sorry. Nice talk, nice presentation. I'm very new in this field, and so my question probably is very naive, but, and I'm working with flies. But I was wondering if you can apply something like that in Drosophila uh, using uh, the genetics to, for example, study the interaction between glia and neurons, or to also charge or to deliver something into the brain and then to find out if you find it in the in the emolymph, for example. I mean, that, that's, uh, that should be obviously the, the thing that we're looking also for, but then in mice. So we try to see the traffic mm -hmm. between surrounding cells with, I mean, neurons or, or a microglia or... Um, uh, or, or, for example, as astrocytes. The problem is always how how good can you get this uh, viral construct in your cells? Microglia are notoriously hard to trans transduce for or transfect even. So, um, if this would be easier to do in the fly, I mean, uh, we're very much open to collaborate and look 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 into that more. Yeah, because the fly, of course, it's much nicer. You can see a lot more systems at work than you have to look at the whole mouse brain. So it would be a great model. Also like C. elegans or something like that. It would be, be very nice to see uh, it also in these kind of models. Yeah. Uh, next question is from Erez. Hey. I don't know if I pronounced yes, that wrong. Yes, no worries. Hey, first of all, as someone that's worked on uh, neuron derived exosomes for a long time or neuron derived DV for a long time, it's really enjoyed the work and the talk and it's, so important uh, in my mind. I was curious if you had a chance to characterize the EVs that are coming from the blood. And the, the idea behind it is that we think that it, it might be a subpopulation of EVs that can cause the BBB and get out of the brain into the blood. And I think that maybe that is an amazing system to check that as well. So did you see a different size uh, when you capture them from the blood and, and, and or other things like that? Yeah, I think it would be very interesting to do that, but we, I think you need to transduce many more cells, I think, in the brain to be able to do like a, a size, um, a size uh, annotation or something like that. But obviously, yeah, that's, that would be amazing if that would be able to be possible to see which kind of brain cells uh, release which kind of EVs. Yeah, that, I think that's everybody's dream that works in neurology, I guess. Uh, if, uh, like I said, again, if somebody can help us or wants to collaborate, please uh, reach out. I mean, we're open to everything. And next question is from Clotilde. Uh, yeah, thanks. So, yeah, a very, very nice, great presentation. Thank you. So I had a technical question first. I was uh, wondering whether the fact that you, you put nanoluciferase outside, was it really important? Because normally the, the substrates for nanoluc, they, they can be cell permeant. So wouldn't, was it really necessary to have nanoluc outside rather than inside the EVs? Did you so, check? Yeah. yeah, so for us, actually, the nano, I mean, when we generated the construct, the idea was we have to have a tag on the outside to see if the flag tag is still intact. So we put something next to the flag tag to know uh, if the flag tag is still attached to uh, to the EV itself. So 
uh, if the flag if the nanolook would be compromised, then we imagined that the flag tag would be compromised. And that's why we had at both sides of the membrane. So it was not really a question if it's self permeable or not. It was just more a, a way to address the integrity of our tag on the outside. So. Okay, I understand. Yeah. And so I was wondering then, uh, uh, so is the follow up, uh, do you have in, in, in mind for follow up to generate mice that would endogenously express this uh, construct, maybe in some specific sub types of tissues to see really the transfer from these tissues to uh, others that do not express, I guess that would be the, the in vivo um, situation that would be really interesting no yeah the whole app is like actually like looking at different cells that traffic to other cells but uh, indeed i mean we, we're <laughs> we're currently doing uh, some of these things uh the only problem it is uh of course if you generate a transgenic mouse um then uh it's a pretty big construct and so you have to in in the beginning so this was a kind of validation um, how if this construct would be worthwhile to pursue in that uh, effort, but obviously uh, now we're looking into uh, specific cell types that can express it and then maybe lead to other ones. Yeah. Um, and well, since I don't know if there are other questions, I'm still <laughs> taking the microphone. So um, uh, I, I wonder why did you choose CD63 for this? Um, because, well, I, I know that you say that you show that you have the, the construct in the internal vesicle, so probably uh, released in exosomes, but you also have it uh, at the plasma membrane. So I suppose that you have both EVs coming from endosomes and from the plasma membrane that you follow, which is probably not your point, but in previous work, uh, the, uh, the group of Xandra had used more generic um, near palm time constructs for labeling all EVs. So was it um, particular uh, for a particular purpose that you choose CD63? Well, when you think about this, you always have to make compromise, <laughs> unfortunately. So palm we couldn't choose because it's only on the inside, so it's not sticking something out. We had another um, uh, project. I mean, Sandra had another project where she had uh, uh, where there's one where there's uh, the protein was sticking out on the membrane, and we saw it was cleaved off. So we wanted a structure where we could embed it actually more in a construct. And CD sixty three was obviously the ones that's most for the moment reported on. So we we took a shortcut and just like uh, went for that one. But obviously this this kind of platform is translatable to I, I guess any uh, tetraspanans. The problem sometimes is that the um, the signaling peptide like for CD sixty three at at the end terminus, but sometimes it's uh, it can be. Theoretically, bioinformatically, they establish it something more embedded in the structure. So that could sometimes we we are afraid that the shuttling would like jeopardize that too. So um, just for the CD sixty two, we went for that one. But um, other people actually asked us to if it would be interesting to, for example, CD eight and these kind of things. So yeah, we we can do it for sure. But I think we should be very um, very noticeable if we don't mutate um, amino acids that uh, can change the trafficking, like for example, sugar containing amino acids and such. So, um, sure, but well, maybe CD9 would have been uh, more widely expressed. That just a suggestion. And also the last last question for me. Sorry, but I wonder why you use the human uh, cDNA if you were planning to use it in vivo in mice. Why didn't you use the mouse uh, sequence of CD63? That's also for another project that we're doing. Uh, so where the human one, we, we aim for that we can distinguish it from the mouse one. Uh, but the antibody seems to not be able to be give us such a resolution yet. Um, so yeah, that was the incentive for that. Uh, that we use the human one, but you're right. I mean, to see the natural endogenous one essentially should CRISPR the endogenous CD63 then, so. Yeah. So I have a question if I may jump in. Um, thanks, thanks everybody for all the good questions today. And this, this maybe is, uh, maybe it's a little bit un unfair to put you on the spot about this, but of course what's on a lot of people's minds is the L1 cam literature 
aperture, whether you can use L1 cam. And are you planning to use this system to understand if L1 cam is, is leaking out of the central nervous system? Because, you know, it's fascinating to look at how the field has developed over the last few years. And you have, um, you have a whole range of opinions right now, ranging from um, there's absolutely no L1 cam on EVs and it cannot be used to pull down neuronal EVs all the way to there's 15% of all the EVs in circulation that are, that are coming from the central nervous system neurons. Um, so it seems like there's quite a range of opinions. Do you, do you have an opinion that you dare to state? <laughs> I if don't. you don't, that's fine too. <laughs> I don't, but maybe David has one. I mean, I understand. I, that's why that was our, again, our incentive to see, like, for example, to find a tag that could be specific for neuronal cells. I mean, that's uh, what, what these tags will do. Um, but yeah, maybe David can jump in here. I don't know. Yeah, um, of course, we can use this system to, to check for that. Um, indeed, we discuss in, in the paper um, this fact because no one is now sure about the, the presence or not, the L1 cam and also the app cam. Uh, so we think we have like, a, even this is an artificial system, we, we can use it to try to understand um, understand the, the role of L1 cam and app cam or other markers. Um, I also had a question as well. Um, so I know that your um, vesicles were mostly um, kind of the size of exosomes. And I wondered if you guys had thought about using um, kind of a, an exosome production inhibitor like a GW4869 or something similar to ensure that they were from a certain, um, coming from a certain place. Yeah, we, we didn't do that, um, but it's a great idea. I'm just not sure if you can overcome with this inhibitor overexpression of your promoter. That's, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, maybe somebody yeah. in the audience knows. So. Yeah, it, the inhibitor isn't like super um, specific either for exosomes, but um, it does have a number of other effects in the cell, but it does reduce um, exosome production. So. Yes, if, if I may jump in, uh, we didn't uh, use the DJW um, but, uh, to inhibit, but uh, we tried to boost the production with mm -hmm. a polycystronic uh, construct, yeah, to see an increase, but it was done only in cells, and we, we haven't yet reported it. Yeah. If there are any more questions, um, now is the time, um, but otherwise, just want to say a really big thank you to both Colin and David. Um, and also ICEV for having SNEF um, help co-moderate today. And um, yeah, that was such a great talk and a really great discussion as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. It was a great presentation. Uh, and thank you all for attending, uh, attending and sorry for those who could not attend because of the unfortunate limit, but we are going to change that <laughs> very soon. Uh, Ken, do you have anything to add? Yeah, we, we've just increased it to 500. So uh, we weren't aware that there was a limit. So uh, so next week, you can all come back and bring four of your friends and we'll be fine. So, so all right. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Take care and we'll see you. We'll see you again very soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.